Uh, thank you all for, uh, for, your, for attending. Uh, this is our second meeting, I believe, uh, of the LDRs, Land Development Regulations. As you know, the city is in the process of rewriting the entire document that's uh, been in existence, being used for about the last 35 years or so. So this is uh, your opportunity to have input into the planning process as we think in terms of the future of Key West. And as you know, what the land development regulations do is it sets the framework, uh, the regulatory framework for which we as the planning department, as well as some of our sister agencies, such as engineering, uh, utilities, uh, review development prospects within this community and then establishes the standards. And again, I like to say they're the minimum standards of development in the community. Uh, part of what we're trying to take a look at is how antiquated uh, the code may be uh, the changes we think might be most appropriate so that we can take this document and tailor it to what we actually do here in Key West. And the reason why you're here is because you're intimately involved in that development process as property owners, as consultants, as architects and engineers, or just as interested citizens as to what the shape of our community should be going forward. And what we're looking for is uh, working with Richard, who's uh, the team leader for Calvin Giordano, to help us work our way through that process. And so as I've said to many folks that have come through our office is that this is a unique opportunity for us to be able to review what we have currently and to be able to project into the future what we think the community should be. Uh, just as a shout out, we earlier today uh, had a work session with uh, Sisevich and Associates and Lambert Advisory looking at Bahama Village. And what we also said to the folks there is that it's important for them to be part of this process and for you also to be part of that process because clearly Bahama Village is part of the overall community as well as specificity of what folks there believe their future should be. And as we look at the land development regulations, clearly that's going to impact not only uh, the properties outside of Bahama Village, but also the properties inside of Bahama Village. Uh, what we're doing today is looking at the affordable housing question uh, that we have before us but within the context of, again, the land development regulations, and are there things in our code currently uh, that prohibit affordable housing from being able to be realized? I've asked the consultants to take a look at some of the initiatives that were done probably in the mid-90s, early 2000s, as to how well uh, those have been used. They may not answer that today, but just as we go through this process, uh, they'll have an opportunity to take a look at that. What incentives or structures will we put in place that would help affordable housing uh, move forward within the context of the fact that we have an allocation system uh, that we have to work through. And uh, one of the key issues, I think, for us going forward is, as we think about issues of density, height, would it make sense to have, let's call it a part A and a part B of the code, one that maybe addresses what happens in Old Town, uh, the historic component of our community, and maybe that might be somewhat different than what's taking place in Newtown, which is more recent development, or at least a different style of development within our community. So there's a lot on their plates uh, to be able to take a look at. So with that, I'd like to introduce Richard with uh, CGA, who will kind of take us through the process of today, taking a look at affordable housing and how we can start having conversations about our land development regulations and how we can start to help make affordable housing more of a reality. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Richard Canoni with Calvin Giordano and Associates. I'm the planning administrator there. Uh, I've got about 23 years of experience um, in all aspects of uh, housing, both from the private side, public side. Um, professionally trained as a planner, but um, affordable housing has been near and dear to me. Uh, my very first job was a VISTA volunteer doing uh, affordable housing, uh, believe it or not, in northwestern Minnesota. Um, so it's very exciting to, uh, to continue that. Uh, with me, I have Nikisha Smith, who's a senior planner, and uh, Roger Carl Carlton as well, part of the team. Uh, a little bit about CGA. We started in 1937 as a uh, small two-person surveying team, Calvin and Barry. And uh, today we have over 300 employees, and one of our main focuses is um, land use planning and urban design. With 300 employees, we have a number of, of disciplines in-house. Um, these are everything that we do. Um, one I wanted to highlight was the planning and zoning, redevelopment, urban design, landscape, and transportation, because these will be the most that will be focused for this project. However, as we continue to draft regulations as it relates to um, stormwater management, we're able to bring in experts within-house to, uh, to sort of analyze those 
to make sure that we're meeting uh, any applicable other regulations from a state perspective. A little bit of our team, as I mentioned, we have a number of, uh, of folks involved from landscape, comp planning, urban design, GIS, um, land development and adaptation, and this is just a list of those, um, those team members. When the RFP was issued, um, there were a number of tasks that, that uh, we were uh, asked to do. Uh, create regulations to implement the 2013 comp plan, resolve inconsistent definitions, terms, standards, codify zoning practices implemented through administrative interpretations, incorporate new standards, programs, processes, and incorporate graphic illustrations uh, which may explain sort of the desired regulations, almost more of a form-based code. Some of the major issues that were identified was to ensure consistency with the comp plan, resolve again the internal inconsistencies in the code, and incorporate new standards, programs, processes, and methods. And the reason I had that underlined is those were, those were defined. Um, the first, go to the next. The first were, why we're here tonight, revisions to the existing workforce housing ordinance, including incentive programs, inclusionary housing programs for redevelopment, and income stratification uh, schemes. Incentive program for creating and or maintaining market rate rental housing. And then we get into climate adaptation, green building, urban design guidelines and zoning regs, landscape architecture standards, sign code, complete streets ordinance, and parking generation standards. So what we've done is we sort of have organized or grouped these together. So the first one on the chart is why is the, the workshop that we're here tonight, affordable and workforce housing. The second, complete streets, uh, parking, transportation, demand management. That'll be tomorrow evening's workshop, same location, same time, here at six o'clock. In August, uh, we'll come back and go over signage in Newtown. Uh, landscape and urban design. And the reason we set that after the, the complete streets, we wanted to get through sort of the transportation engineering aspect of it and then come back in with sort of the streetscape and urban design uh, to complement it. And then finally will be uh, green building, adaptation planning, and disaster planning. So workforce housing, this is the current definition um, of what workforce housing or affordable workforce housing shall include low income, median income, moderate income, and middle income. So you see the rates, the 80, 100, 120, and 140, and the number below is at 30% of, of, um, of the income on a 12-month uh, basis of what they should be able to spend monthly on, on housing. Some of our initial observations, um, a lot of infill potential, um, you know, commercial sites that were undeveloped, um, the possibly accessory units, uh, housing authority property, Transition from workforce to retirement housing for people that want to stay here after they work. Um, there was really no true incentive um, for affordable and rent rental housing. Uh, no density bonuses or increases. Uh, it was most expensive for single person, one bedroom inefficiency it seemed like to develop. A um, little bit of a confusing workforce housing ordinance. It only applies to new development, not redevelopment. Um, there is some land authority funding, which is pretty significant. Uh, one thing we talked about is the possibility of recapturing uh, uh, B pass units. And what I mean by that is as these, what we're trying to determine is of the new affordable units that have come on in the last, say, I don't know, five, 10 years, where did those people move from? Did they move from the city of Key West itself? Did they move you know, from Monroe County? Did they move from Collier County? And the intent there is to to look at whether there's a way to recapture it because those people are already essentially counted for uh, within the, the evacuation model. So if we're just moving crowded people into a different house, um, should we really count them twice as far as the B pass? So that's something you know, we're looking at um, whether or not the state buys off. But again, we're, we're trying to sort of look at all aspects here and, and think, about, think outside the box. Um, again, look at recapturing some of the lost market rate units. We have a number of folks, obviously, that buy second homes. They may have been uh, two or three units at one time, and now uh, those units are lost. And again, obviously, the largest obstacle is the rate of growth ordinance. So again, going back to the task and goals, um, incentive program, inclusionary housing, income stratification, and incentive program for creating and or maintaining market rate rental. So the way I sort of approach this for at least this evening, and again, I want to make sure everybody understands this isn't, you know, 
going to get adopted next week. We're at the, you know, this is a, like our second meeting. You know, so this is really to, to start a discussion. Uh, there's a number of items, again, that we're going to talk, talk about this evening. And what I'd like to do after each item, uh, just go ahead and open it up for any questions. You can hold them again for the end, but if there's something uh, burning that you want to ask, please feel free to feel free to interrupt. I'm hoping to have more of a dialogue and a discussion. Um, but the first is um, getting into the definition of how we define uh, afford workforce affordable housing. So you see the strike through underline. The intent here was to remove um, the middle income, the, the 140. From the, uh, from the definition and include the very low, the 50% of median. So that gives you, uh, based on the current um, workforce housing income and rental limits, uh, very low is 30,600, 30, and the moderate 120 goes up to 73,440. And so what we did is we kind of looked, okay, what's, what are some of the positions that are available now um, that are currently being advertised and sort of where do they fall in for non-management um, and you see almost all of them are at 80, 80 or below. There's, I think, one below 50%. Um, but these are current salaries of, you know, of, the, of the folks that work uh, here in, in government, in QS. Determining need. So what we did is we looked at the city's comprehensive plan. And these were numbers that were adopted in March of uh, 2013, which shows a pretty significant deficit in surplus. And given the... The current ROGO, um, you know, whether we'll ever be able to, to make up for it or be able to provide in the future, um, all of those units is, is slim to none, but we have to, we have to at least start somewhere. Uh, so for owners, um, you see the largest, we can go to the next. The largest uh, deficit was at the 80 and, and 120% range, uh, which is about almost 3,800 units. Um, which is a, a, a split of about six, between 60 and 40 percent between the two. For renters, it was a little different. Um, what the numbers showed before that was that there was a, um, there was a surplus of rental units for 120 percent. So for this instance, we, we focused on those at 80 and 50 percent of median. And it's a little bit of a different split. Uh, with the greatest need, as would be expected, at 50% at, uh, of the median. So inclusionary units. So this is the existing ordinance. Um, there's a lot of text, but at least 10% of all new multifamily uh, shall be low-income affordable units. Um, and then 20% shall be affordable median income housing units. And then residential or mixed-use projects less than 10 or mixed-use shall be required to develop at least 30% of the units um, for affordable median income, but may contribute a fee in lieu of um, to the trust fund if approved by the city commission. And that fee is uh, $200,000, representing construction costs less land and of a 400-square-foot unit. So what we're sort of proposing is to look at all residential development uh, be required uh, at least 15%. And those units be restricted by moderate, low, and very low, either at an affordable rent or affordable ownership cost. And, and those will be defined terms that I'll get into. And some things we looked at as possible exemptions would be reconstruction of any structures that have been destroyed by fire, flood, or, or act of God, um, development that already has more units that qualify, uh, housing constructed by other government agencies, such as like the Housing Authority, um, secondary dwelling units and rental projects with three units or less. So affordable rent means the monthly rent that, that doesn't exceed the following calculations. So for low income, it would be 1 12th of 30% of 80% of the income, which equals the number that we had previously on, on, the, uh, on the slide. And this is just that, that monthly income. And those numbers were taken from, again, this is the, the numbers that were adopted uh, recently by the city. Uh, that, that the county puts out as the 2015 qualifying income limits. And that's what the affordable ownership would, would be based on. Uh, they set a, I know you can't see it here, but they set a maximum sales price um, for both an efficiency one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom apartment. So the way we have that we're, we're examining, looking at setting up this inclusionary rental um, again, for new and, new and redevelopment, 
again, it's focused on that 80-20 split. Um, I won't get all into the, to the numbers because I don't want everybody to glaze over. Unfortunately, with land development regulations, sometimes they get very technical. Um, but we will have this on the website, and I, you know, I'll give everybody my card to make sure that, that I can answer any of the questions. But this just gives you the limit of the 15% and how it would be split. Um, so for instance, if you had a, a 20 unit development, you would be required to do three inclusionary units. One of those would be at 80% and below, and three of those, I'm sorry, two of those would be at 50% and below. For, for sale, a project, um, if it's between two and six units, it would either provide a, um, provide a one unit or pay, the, pay a fee in lieu. Um, if it's, ten, you know, say a 12-unit uh, project, you would be required four units and two of those would have to be, the two that would be, re I'm sorry, the two that would be required would be 120% of the median. And again, those were based on the numbers that came from the, uh, the comp plan. So as we get into the in-lieu fees, um, again, projects six or fewer have the option of paying a fee or providing the unit. If there are more than six units, uh, the item would go to the commission um, as to whether they would be able to pay all um, in lieu or produce some alternatives, um, such as offsite construction, land dedication, or credit transfers to either a private or city-owned property. Um, these, again, are, are preliminary concepts that we're, that we're looking at. So in setting up the inclusionary fee, you know, there's a number of different ways to look at it. The, this was one that we're exploring initially uh, is we took the median price of the maximum allowed. So if you remember the 2015 income qualifica qualification sheet that was adopted, as I mentioned, efficiency one bedroom, the maximum sales price is 264,000, two bedroom 299, 200, three bedroom 334, 400. So what we did is we took the median of those, which is 281, 600. So in calculating the fees, we, for an example, I used just a four unit, say single family attached uh, development. Uh, the median price based on the 2014 median sales price uh, we got from the Key West Realtors Association was 606,500 um, was the median sales price last year. Uh, so we subtracted that from 281,600, so that gives you sort of the gap or the difference in between. Um, what we took there is multiply that um, by the fraction of 15%, which is a 0.6 uh, multiplier. Uh, so the in-lieu fees for this project would roughly be close to what would be required initially by the city, that 200,000, but slightly less at 194,940. So the density bonus, as we're uh, on, what, what we're proposing or examining, is a 25% um, density bonus. Uh, and that would be based on 20% of the total units um, at 80% of the median, or 10% of the units focused at 50% of the median. And there were some defined, defined terms, density bonus, again, 25% over the otherwise maximum residential density. Um, density bonus with additional incentives. Um, again, reduction of development standards or modifications. This could be done through, through the site plan review process. Regulatory incentives. Um, that would result in, identify, in identifiable cost reductions or avoidances. Uh, deferred permit fees or impact fees, they could be, be actually paid from, from other sources. Or direct financial aid in the form of a loan, grant, subsidy, or low interest financing. Equivalent financial incentives would mean a monetary contribution on a per, per cost unit equal to, um, based on the land, equal to the density, density bonus uh, with the, the incentive or uh, the density bonus where, where an additional incentive is not requested or is determined to be unnecessary. So again, we're just trying to build in flexibility for infill. It's, it's extremely difficult and there's not always a one-size approach. So this was just to offer, offer some, um, some alternatives. So without going through the, the entire technical aspect of, of how the density bonus works, I'll show you an example. Um, on a one-acre site, let's use a 22-unit acre um, Density, you have a max of 22 units. Um, under the inclusionary housing, you would be required, this is a rental project, you would be required three inclusionary units, one at 80%, two at 50% of uh, median income. The density bonus 
the 25 percent would, would equal six units. And under the density bonus, back to the definitions, everything is rounded up. It's rounded to the next integer. So everything is, is rounded up. Um, so for workforce or workforce, workforce affordable, you sort of have two choices. Um, you either provide the 80 or the 50, and the inclusionary units are counted within that. So sort of a summary, you would have 28 units, and you would either do five units for 80 and two at 50, or you would do three units for 50 and one at 80 for a total of four units. And as we started to run some of the numbers, it seemed like they, they equalized, but again, we're looking for feedback, uh, obviously, from, uh, from you guys. On a four-cell project, again, the ratios are a little bit different rather than the 80-20, um, but on a one-acre, 22 units, again, I don't know if we would ever have that for a single family, possibly for a townhouse. Um, again, same bonus of six units. Uh, this example, you would have the 28 units, five would be at, at 120 and one at 80 percent, three at 80 and two at 120. And again, these were based on that initial need from the uh, comprehensive plan. One of the other concepts that we started looking at that we talked about at, at our, our initial meeting was the idea of a floating zone. Um, this isn't a new concept. It's been around for uh, quite a long period of time. Uh, it was actually developed to uh, provide housing. Uh, but it's usually very specific uh, to obtain density bonus height extensions in exchange for some other, uh, some other um, uh, requirements, such as affordable housing, transit, green building. So the zone floats. It basically, so even though it's a zoning category, it's not explicitly mapped until the project is approved. So, so it's similar to a PUD, but different. So some of the components that we're examining that could be part of this, um, minimum height of one story, maximum 40 feet, which is by code, with the possibility of maybe 60 feet, but we do know that would require a referendum. Uh, density, none. We would have no density requirements. Um, that's something that we would, we would explore, or I think we recommend really exploring. Whether that's controlled through, again, the B, the B pass allocations, um, I think there's other measures that we could put in place. Given the restriction in height and unit size, uh, we, might, uh, we may not need a density uh, allocation in this specific, uh, in this specific zone. Uh, looking at a minimum lot size of a quarter acre uh, and no parking uh, with the possibility of paying into a fund for streetscapes. Um, or if you were to provide parking, it would be one space for two units. Uh, and the 250 number comes from the latest numbers I got on, a, on um, cost for a surface lot for, per space. Uh, so that's where that, that number comes from. Uh, bike and scooter parking, one space per unit. And what we were proposing is to decrease the unit size, um, what they call now our micro units, to a uh, 300 square foot uh, minimum. One thing with small units, floor height is, seems, needs to be a little bit higher. We would set a minimum floor height at nine feet. Uh, and again, minimum unit size is, again, for micro units, 300, 300 to 400. Similar to what you had mentioned earlier, one thing we would propose that it, for a B-pass allocation that the micro units be counted as a half unit. Um, and then you go up to the 0.78, which is currently in place for the efficiency, one bedroom, one, and two bedroom, another one unit. Uh, we would require some sort of, what we're recommending is that you would require some sort of green building certification or designation. Uh, and then also incorporate proximity requirements so that they be, re they be located near a transit stop if we're not gonna require parking or, or close to a city garage where they may be able to lease, uh, lease spaces. And then for the components of the project, um, rather than have specific set-asides, it would be a percentage basis uh, and the height bonus would be based on that average. So an average of 120%, you would be at the 40 foot limitation, an average of 150 feet, and an average of 80% of the median, you could go all the way up to the 60 foot uh, maximum. Uh, there would be an affordable housing workforce agreement, and one thing we looked at is whether or not to put in building permit time frames that once it's approved, you have 18 months to, um, to apply for a permit with a six month extension. This way they're not, they're not sitting in limbo. 
So again, so sort of that average, I wanted to give everybody the, the example of, um, you know, if you were to average, uh, you know, the 100%, what does it look like uh, on a 20 unit project for, for sale? Um, so of the 20 units, five would be at 50. I mean, there, there could be a number of different combinations, obviously. Uh, for this example, we, we had two at 50, eight at 80, five at 120, um, and five at market. Whether that's, you know, whether we put a 140 limitation on that or just let it be completely open to a market rate unit. Um, again, these were concepts that, um, that we're continuing to explore. Micro units. So this was, um, if you look at the picture, this is sort of a, what a micro unit would look like, 10 by 30. Uh, and this is from uh, the ULI, which is the Urban Land Institute, put out a, a study where they looked at um, the micro view on micro units. And uh, there's about 50 definitions of, of micro units. Um, the, we were attempting to sort of define it. Uh, for Key West, we would explicitly put in there that it would not, um, be permitted for transient accommodations that uh, it would need to be, remain for, for housing. Uh, this is an image that uh, actually was from a project in, in Seattle uh, that I thought was pretty interesting for a 300, you know, 300 square foot unit. Uh, I think when these went on the market, they sold out within weeks um, as an affordable unit. Um, so the picture on the left is sort of daytime, the picture on the, on the right is evening. Uh, they have a, like a Murphy bed that, that sort of pops down and opens into a table that can then, um, or is a table then that's folded down and it is the, uh, the bed in the evening. Um, there's also a, a bench on the end that, at, the, um, at the almost like bay window that can be converted from a table and it pushes down uh, into a bench. Uh, so there are, there are um, people doing it. There's uh, manufacturers making uh, cabinets and uh, similar items, but this just gives you a, a little flavor of what, um, you know, what a micro unit is, or what intended to be. So now going back to city, city owned parcels, um, some of the regulatory components, again, that, we're, that we would examine or are looking at are um, you know, permitted impact fees paid through, through funding, whether it be land, land, land authority, um, partner with the housing authority to transfer the lead. I know this, is, this has been a debate. Um, or you, you know, I know that you have to issue a referendum um, or, or transfer it to another agency. Um, so these are, you know, these are obviously items that, that will be discussed. Uh, requiring whether or not we require rezoning to the, um, to the floating zone as a means to develop city-owned property. Whether it be tied to a, the B-pass allocation and, and put in the user lose. Um, another part of that is that sort of permit expediting that we will make sure is, is, a, is a component, not just of city-owned, but but overall, um, the next one I want to I talk about, what I'm calling is um, adaptive dwelling units. And these are sort of um, your infill or you know, the single family home that may have, have two units. Um, for something like this, you know, there's always illegal units that are currently out there. So whether or not you can, you can do an amnesty period uh, to at least get them to come into compliance or at least bring the property up to uh, life safety uh, issues uh, and not have those count against a B pass. Uh, again, the focus again would be in infill and redevelopment uh, in those transition areas, not in the single family neighborhoods. Making sure that the, the, the design is consistent with the surrounding area um, and they would not be eligible again for any sort of height bonus under, they would all um, be restricted to the underlying zoning controls. Uh, one of the things that we examined was we keep a, mi a minimum of 5,000 square foot lot. And I know everyone's going to give a gasp when they hear a density of 50 units an acre. Um, but it, it may or may not be appropriate. But again, this is something that um, we're, you know, we want to discuss and, and get input on. Uh, so on a, on a 5,000 square foot lot, that's about four units. So using, again, the micro unit um, target, this is actually a... Uh, you can't see the dimensions, but this lot, I think, oh, there is 45 by 105 feet. Uh, this one, ha this example shown has eight units. Um, so ex think of that with four units. If you're using a micro unit, um, that's about 1,200 square feet, which really isn't that much different than a lot of the single-family homes. So that's where, that's where that density number came from. 
Uh, if you go to, I'm sorry, can we go back real quick? The other thing was to make, making sure that, that you had a minimum of a 30 foot uh, rear yard setback uh, so that there was open space and light. If you went to a second level, um, this is the next example. Uh, I know this number is big, but again, this is 16 units uh, at about 146 units an acre. So that's, I don't want to say 146 units an acre and everyone gasp, um, but in the context of it, it's probably about maybe 4,000 4, square feet. Not that different than some of the lar larger homes, but it's again, not that we're recommending the 146, it was more of just to show it uh, in context to the, um, to the 50 units an acre. And then Monroe County, um, the Land Development Authority. Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware of the Senate Bill 1216 that was signed by the governor, um, effective date of 515, uh, which now allows that money to be used for construction, redevelopment, or preservation of affordable housing. Uh, so some of the um, regulatory components that we're examining, again, is, is um, land purchase, the possibility of interest buy-down depending on, on the program. Um, one thing we looked at that I started examining was the cost of insurance here. Um, obviously, if you're a newer property, you get, you, know, it, you get a little bit of a better rate, but some of these affordable units that might be in the older part of town, um, whether they be for sale or rental, um, even if it's mortgage, you kind of have an idea, uh, a pretty good idea of what your costs are gonna be annually on your, on your mortgage payment. Um, but that insurance renewal, um, I know when I had a house, we were, we were dropped every year only to have a new policy written at about twice the amount. Um, so this is something to maybe explore on, on a smaller project, um, maybe for very low income, um, to keep those units affordable so, so that you don't have those uh, units foreclosing. Um, participation in land acquisition, um, looking at maybe underwriting the cost of major systems to reduce operating costs. Um, this would be like a gray water system, uh, whether that be incorporated into a multifamily project. Uh, and the gray water basically reuses some of the sinks. Um, you could reuse it for the toilets. There's a number of systems out there. So it would uh, also cut down on uh, some of the water use in, in the city. Uh, whether those funds be paid for impact fees, and I know the city currently has has two programs, um, a home buyer assistance and move-in assistance. So these are, these are a number of things that, um, again, we're gonna continue to explore as, as we formulate these regulations. Um, sort of our next, um, you know, I mentioned the meeting tomorrow. Our, our next grouping would be, uh, we're anticipating these coming in August. Again, it would be a two-day um, where we would look at signage in Newtown, landscape, urban design, uh, green building, adaptation planning, and disaster planning. And, and the urban design, that's where you'll, as we start to develop some of the affordable housing concepts, um, that will also play into some of the urban design as we start testing some of the things. So again, it's not gonna be um, uh, fi our, the final product, but at least we wanna present something uh, as, a, as a discussion item.